Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I'm turning off my cell phone, so if you can too, that'd be great. And um, that way you can hear Bill's genius kind of uninterrupted. I'm Steve Davis. I'm the assistant curator here for the Southwestern Writers Collection. And it's my great honor to welcome you all here. And I get to introduce our special guest today. And um, my apologies in advance because I'm going to take a little more time probably than I should. But, um, you know, when you have somebody like Bill Minutaglio come to your campus, it's such a great opportunity. And I sort of want to make sure everybody has kind of an idea of who it is we have here today. And so please bear with me, and if you start to fall asleep, just rest assured that Bill will be coming up pretty soon to talk himself. So many of you probably know, if you hang around places like this, the Literary Archive, or read much about how writing is done, you know that pretty much 99% of the writers working in the world today do not make a dime from their writing. And so they're compensated in a different form of currency and that is abundant, fulsome praise. And they get this praise from those who understand best how much they need it, and that's other writers. And so if any of you uh, remember the old spy magazine, it had a very funny feature called Log Rolling in Our Time. And this was about the reciprocal dust jackets that authors would routinely give each other. For example, Anthony Burgess would describe Robertson Davies as a mature and wise writer, while Davies would pronounce Burgess a delight to read. Closer to home, we have some kind of funny examples from some of the writers we have here in the Southwestern Writers Collection. Um, here's a novel by Bud Shrake, and it's blurbed by Larry L. King, who basically says that Shrake writes with wit and a lyrical quality, even when addressing frontier violence and rough justice. He entertains even as he instructs. And about the same year, Larry L. King's book came out, and here's Bud Shrake. This book takes you inside the life of a working writer, and it's peppered with stories that'll make you laugh out loud. So, you know. And this, this trend has really kind of increased in recent years to the point where even those writers I call the caninographers are doing it. Some of you may be familiar with John Katz, who wrote Soul of a Dog. And here's what he said about Don, uh, John Grogan, the author of Marley and Me. In the hands of a writer as observant, unsentimental, and piercing as Grogan, this human canine journey, this is one that dog lovers will want to take. And John Grogan on John Katz. Unburdened by sentimentality, Katz's keen insights cut to the heart of the human-pet relationship. So... There's this long tradition of log rolling. And with that in mind, I was naturally very suspicious of Bill Minutaglio before I ever read his work. And that's because everywhere I turned, I would see this exorbitant, extravagant praise for his writing. I'd read comparisons of his work to people like Tom Wolfe and Hunter Thompson, and I'd just kind of shake my head and go, yeah, right. And then something funny happened. Um, I happened to cross an excerpt of one of Bill's books and it was reprinted in an anthology, Literary Austin. And of course, I was just blown away. <laughs> and it was one of those times where you run around saying, why didn't anybody tell me about this guy? And then you realize people were telling you about this guy. And so even though I realized that, you know, log rolling is an important part of the literary ecosystem, there actually are writers out there who really deserve the high praise for their work, uh, such as Bill because people are simply responding honestly to his accomplishments. Over the last few years, I've loved becoming familiar with Bill's writing. We've been very fortunate to have him as a donor here to the Whitliff Collections, and it's a great honor for me personally to count Bill as a friend. And Bill's one of those people, when he's your friend, he makes you feel so special and um, gives you, you know, the, the fullness of his attention and so forth. And I know there are many, many others he's like that with, and I think that gift is part of what makes Bill such a great reporter because he kind of sets people at ease and draws them out. And so I don't want to embarrass Bill by gushing too much today. <laughs> and, you know, I want to avoid the, the log rolling thing myself. But, but I want to provide a little background for how, how this book came to be published in our book series. 
It was about 1978 when Bill came to Abilene, Texas, fresh from New York City, and he spent a couple of years as a reporter in Abilene and then moved on to newspapers in San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. In each city, he confronted an ugly reality. Black Texans rarely made the news in their hometowns unless they had been accused of some sort of crime. So if you consider the ramifications of such a thing, let's say you're a historian and you want to write a history of Texas in the 20th century or some aspect of it. Well, historians naturally turn to newspapers as kind of a primary source, and a lot of people still believe that these newspapers are models of objectivity. And so as you go through these newspapers in these cities, you get, um, well, you get kind of a, it's, uh, well, I would say that, you know, the, the three blind men who were describing an elephant were probably closer on target than the newspapers in Texas had been describing African Americans in this state. And so Bill was somebody who instinctively recognized that entire communities' histories were being lost. And as somebody drawn to the African American heritage, he wanted to help preserve it. So as a young reporter, he began going to barbecue joints, and record stores, churches, blues clubs, and he began walking through neighborhoods and hanging out on porches and knocking on doors. And he wasn't always welcomed, at least not at first, but his quiet, respectful persistence paid off. And before long, Minu Taglio was getting these stories. And he was writing about everything from the people on a street named Congo Street in Dallas, within the shadow of the state fairgrounds to the underappreciated blues pianist, Alex Moore, who died at age 89 while carrying his groceries home on a city bus. And as Bill noted in his story, people that age should never have to wait at bus stops. People that age should never stand alone at night, big brown bags of groceries tucked under their arms. And so you have a guy who's writing his stories about these people and you can probably imagine how some of the editors in Texas newspapers in the 1970s and 80s, even up into the 90s, and perhaps even the present, um, were reacting to Bill's agenda, as it were. Um, and I guess you ran into a few situations here and there, but the point is that Bill began winning these awards for his stories, and diversity gradually came into more and more favor. And so by the time Bill left... Um, his position as a newspaper journalist in the 1990s, he had published hundreds of stories on African Americans in Texas. And in the 2000s, Bill has emerged as a major literary figure in Texas. His work has appeared in many national magazines, um, including, as you mentioned earlier today, a People magazine, <laughs> and a few others as well. Um, and his books have been widely acclaimed. Uh, Esquire magazine called his first book, City on Fire, the explosion that devastated a Texas town and ignited a historic legal battle. This is the book about the Texas City explosion, 1947, if you're not familiar with that. Um, Esquire called that one of the greatest tales of survival ever told. And the Washington Post described it as a terrific nonfiction work that has the narrative force of an adventure novel. And the Texas Observer said simply that this book is one of the finest books ever written about Texas. And that book was optioned by the actor Tom Cruise and um, we're kind of hoping that Tom will get on with making the movie now so Bill can retire in comfort. <laughs> and, and then there was another Minutaglia opus, First Son, George W. Bush and the Bush Family Dynasty, and that was called Excellent by the New York Review of Books, Masterly by The Economist. And if you saw Oliver Stone talking about his movie W, he kept talking about Bill's book and how great it was. And another nonfiction book is The President's Counselor, the Rise to Power of Alberto Gonzalez, which the New York Times called fascinating, the San Antonio Express called brilliant, and the San Francisco Chronicle called chilling. And I don't think we've heard yet what Alberto Gonzalez himself thinks of the book, but I imagine if you asked him, he would say that he doesn't recall having read it, right? So. And in 2009, Bill co-authored the biography of Molly Ivins with Michael Smith, and this book performed the great accomplishment of deepening our appreciation for that wonderfully complex person that Molly Ivins was, while at the same time kind of describing the entire social context that helped create her and who she became. And this book, like pretty much everything Bill does, earned stellar reviews from coast to coast. And Bill teaches in journalism department at 
the University of Texas in Austin. And one of my favorite reviews of the Molly Ivins book uh, came from Kirkus, which said, aspiring journalists, read this book and then get to work. So kind of where we are here at the Southwestern Writers Collection, we have this guy who's become a major writer in Texas, and back in his personal history in his literary archives are these many, many really amazing stories he's written about African Americans in Texas. And the significance of these early stories has really ripened over the years, and these have become basically history now. And these are stories that chronicle people whose lives would have been lost forever if Bill hadn't been there to, to get the stories down on paper. The other thing I should say about Bill is he's not only a terrific reporter, he's a, one of the most gifted writers to call Texas home. His writing is informed by a deep passion for the blues, and he works in a rhythmic, circular motion. He kind of gathers groups of words together, and then suddenly, kind of startlingly, they just take flight, and you're just sort of left in awe at, at the formation that uh, unfolds before you. And um, when I read Bill, I started to realize that these kind of dazzling literary riffs really evoke the great guitar leads of players like T-Bone Walker. And I started to realize why Bill has received such praise for his work, because I've noticed now um, myself the thing, same thing a lot of other writers have done, which is you, know, you study how Bill Mintotaglio handles his prose the way guitarists would study how Steve Ray Vaughan played his guitar. I mean, there's a real similarity there. And so this book here, the newest book in our series, In Search of the Blues, which is for sale out front. Um, this collects Bill's best and most enduring writing on African Americans in Texas. And a book like this really helps shift the axis of our state's literature and kind of opens up a whole new world for many white Texans um, to, to get a view, an intimate view of people and places and times that are kind of otherwise shrouded in mist. This is a great example of why our book series exists, and it's my great honor to welcome our distinguished guest, a man you could fairly describe as, well, probably the most brilliant and humane writer in American history, or maybe the history of the world even. <laughs> is, that, is that too, too much log rolling there? Okay, <laughs> that's great. So anyway, please join me in welcoming Bill Minutaglio. Thank you. 